Well, greetings, friends. It's Danielle Smith with Alberta Enterprise Group. And I should just say we had an amazing uh, event yesterday with Michelle Rempel Garner, who is a Conservative Party of Canada MP, had until recently been the uh, the critic for natural resources. But we ended up with a roundtable discussion talking about, once again, the pathway to net zero. How do we get there? Now, I recognize there's a little skepticism out there. It seems to me that uh, anytime you grab, gather a group of people together, you've got uh, those like me who are enthusiastic that we can meet the net zero target and it will unleash an immense amount of possibility, entrepreneurship and new industries. And then there's others who think not so much, it's not, it's not possible to get there. So um, I want to take another bite at this in a different way. We've talked an awful lot about what happens in the energy sector. And I want to turn attention in this podcast to what is happening in agriculture. I think there's a lot that uh, could potentially be done. By the way, if anyone knows anyone working on a project to convert agricultural equipment to hydrogen, that's one thing that I, I haven't heard. And that's kind of a missing piece about how we could potentially meet this net zero target in the uh, in the uh, agriculture sector and in rural. So if uh, anyone knows about that, let me know. But we are going to talk specifically about uh, planting materials in greenhouses, so industrial use, but also in, in personal use, because this is an area with an immense amount of opportunity to create new products, new products that, here's the thing, are actually better and are either the same cost or cheaper, and also reach the goal of uh, having a lower carbon footprint. Can we do all this? Oh, yes, we can with my next guest. Ryan Rand is the CEO, and he's the founder of a company called Pure Life Carbon. They're building a plant in Red Deer. He joins us now from Barbados, which is, uh, I'm sure he's doing an immense amount of research down there, which is very, very important for the continued work of Pure Life. But uh, we, we, I just mentioned that because um, he's a little bit worried that his internet might be unstable. So if I have to, to talk through 30 seconds and summarize just because of uh, instability in the in the line, you will know why. I just wanted to give you that background. But Ryan, thank you so much for being with us today. Morning, Danielle. How are you? I'm, I'm so good. For, first of all, why don't you just give us a little bit of your of your corporate background? Tell us about the the vision of, of Pure Life Carbon and, and, and then we'll get into some of the products that you have and where you plan to go. Sure. So Pure Life Carbon, is a clean tech business that manufactures advanced carbon technologies, which are environmentally and socially responsible. Our company was founded to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, combat agriculture waste and pollution, while helping to feed a growing global population. Our products are unique. They're defining, defining a new market segment, and they're solving problems for growers that were really unsolvable in the past. Okay, perfect. What is your personal history? Are you a biologist or what, 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 what is your background? <laughs> I always say I'm a jack of all trades, master <laughs> of none, which as an entrepreneur is much better than one. Uh, my background is army, oil and gas, working as a drilling fluids engineer, construction, and now clean tech and agriculture. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit then about why you, you chanced upon this particular type of product. What, what, what problems are you trying to solve? Well, we're trying to solve problems that exist in the environment as far as uh, carbon negative production of some agricultural goods. Like I mentioned a, a couple of seconds ago, really bringing new types of technologies to the, to the world that can combat some of the climate issues that we're facing, but also be high performing, displacing technologies of legacy, pro of legacy products that are out there. And as you mentioned kind of in the introduction, be cost effective or in many cases, even cheaper than the stuff that's being used today. So let's narrow down what we're talking about, because we're not talking about the ranching sector and we're not talking about large scale field crops either, correct? We're just, we're specifically talking about applications for, for greenhouses. Yeah, so we have product applications for pretty much all different uses in the agriculture space, but we're a startup. So we're staying very focused on one particular area of that segment, which for us is indoor controlled environment growers or growers that grow in containers. So conventional hydroponics like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, strawberries. Uh, and we also have some mm -hmm. ornamentals and other types of, of growers that use blended uh, substrates for their, for their growing environment. You didn't mention cannabis, which is of course the new growing area in 
no pun intended, in, in Alberta <laughs> agriculture, is is your product also for use in that in that type of environment? Yeah, our product is useful for basically all types of plants. And cannabis is a big segment that we service in the in the Canadian industry. Of course, it's growing uh, very rapidly on a global basis, and uh, we do quite a bit of work directly with cannabis companies as well. Yes. So why Alberta for your product? Because we'll, we'll get into it in a, in, a, in a bit about how you develop this different growing medium. But why did you choose Alberta as a, the, the place to set up your plant? Well, the three founders that started Pure Life Carbon were all from Alberta. So oh. we're Alberta born and bred and we love the province. And that's where the technology started. Like this come from research done at Lethbridge College by Dr. Nick Savadoff that was started well over 18 years ago. And the myself and the other co-founders had an opportunity to commercialize and advance that technology and take it to the market. So it was created in Alberta. And naturally, we launched our business and took it to the market from Alberta. So tell us what the research was. What was the what, what was the starting point? The starting point was, again, tackling challenges in the growing medium space. So if you think about what growers actually grow their plants in, you have a couple of different products in that space. Stone wool or rock wool is a brand name of product that many uh, indoor growers use, coconut, choir, and peat moss. And all three of these products have significant issues that they create for the environment. So Dr. Savadoff, many years ago, started looking at the challenges and realizing that some things needed to change from a substrate perspective. And he started working on carbon-based materials because when you kind of drill down into these growing medium uh, products, they're very large in volume. Like if you look at peat moss, for example, it's estimated over 60 million cubic meters per year of this stuff is transported around the world. So the question starts to come, if peat moss is bad for the environment, which it's estimated to be responsible for somewhere between five and 9% of the global greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emissions, which when you compare that to the entire agriculture space, which is estimated at 12%, that is a very large number and a, mm -hmm. an area that you can focus on. And to be fair, agriculture companies have been focused on solving these issues for decades, but what can you mine, manufacture or farm to the tune of 60 million cubic meters per year that is more environmentally responsible than farming something like peat moss, for example. So that's what really, I believe, sparked Dr. Savadoff to look in this direction and start working with carbons. Mm -hmm. We're breathing carbons, we're made of carbons, the desk we're leaning on it has carbons in them. So they're extremely abundant and they're scalable to the point where you can use them as a, as a feedstock. So I believe that, Danielle, that's what, that's what started it off. And then when we started looking at the technology after Dr. Savadoff had some breakthroughs in that industry, we started looking at commercial technology to manufacture it at scale, because when we first figured out how to do it, it wasn't economical. So that took us a little bit of, of time to figure out the manufacturing systems and get them patented. And then we started looking at go-to-market strategies. How, as a small Alberta-based company, do we enter into this global stage where we're talking about a $26 billion plus market, that there's three products that dominate most mm -hmm. of that market. And in turn, only a couple of companies that are very large that basically own that market space. Okay, so I'm not a farmer and I'm not a particular green thumb either. I do have a few container boxes. So I, <laughs> I am familiar with how you have to mix soils to be able to get the the, the, the uh, right level of nutrients and quantity. But I must admit, I don't know what peat moss stone wool and cook acquire is supposed to do what is the purpose of it and because then to, that's our starting point so that i know what it is you're trying right. to replace so those three products are just materials that plants grow in similar to soil that you would use in your garden but a lot of indoor growers or commercial growers they need to reduce risk or enhance performance so they select materials like peat moss which is mined from the earth or coconut choir which is kind of the outside shell of of coconut husks or stone wool, which is a synthetic manufactured product to be able to optimize their growing environment. These products typically come with a multitude of things inside of them, nutrients and microbes. Sometimes that's good for the plant. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it has heavy metals, pesticides and herbicides. And that's why you hear about some of the, the scares in the food industry around uh, e. coli outbreaks and lettuce, for example, and things like that. These are organic living environments with the exception of, of stone wool, which is synthetic. And they come with things in them. So we call those 
uh, growing medium. So that's one way to define them. And growers are really finicky about how they deal with those types of materials. They all have their different mix that they like to use if you're talking about coconut or, or peat moss. Um, in the stone wool industry, there's different volumes or different kind of blends of the fiber that provide different benefits for the, for the plants based on what they choose. So our product is a replacement for those materials. Okay. It's 100% carbon based and it's well, meant as a replacement. So what does it look like when you buy it? I guess I'm, I'm picturing the, uh, the bags of three in one mix that I, that I picked up at PB Mart last summer. What, what would, what would I be picking up if I was, if I was buying your product? Is, it's unlike is it anything kind of you've, it's unlike oh. anything you've seen in the past, which is one of the interesting things behind the product. Like you look at it and you think to yourself, really, this is a growing medium. I can grow plants just in this product all on its own. And the way I'd explain it to the audience is it's like a carbon that you would see in your fireplace after you burn wood, but it's small and they're very hard particles. So we're talking about one to three millimeters in size, granular material that when stacked together, fill up a container, just like a, a peat moss or a soil blend would fill up your container at home. So it kind of just, it looks like the leftover from a, from a, 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 a wood fire. It does, but it's much cleaner and much harder. So it doesn't break down and it maintains its shape long-term. Talk to me a little bit about this, because I, I mentioned to you when we were doing our pre-interview that I, I know a company in Medicine Hat, I really hope I can get them on called can carb and i got introduced to them years ago and they have found a way to just split the methane molecule which is ch4 and then use the hydrogen to keep on splitting the methane and then they create this pure stream of carbon black which is a very high quality product and it goes on to create o-rings in spaceships which requires a very a high level of um of pure carbon as well as all the rubber that you'd see on your on your vehicle so i thought oh my gosh there must be a lot of applications for this particularly in the agriculture sector and you said that not all carbon is created equal so you're going to have to give me a bit of a chemistry lesson so that i understand sure. that what makes your carbon unique yeah that's a great question and the carbon space which has interestingly been around for thousands of years is not well studied in many areas and there's a lot of advancements coming out of the the new environmental kind of push to look at carbon negative types of mediums or or products uh, that can help heal some of the environmental damage that's been done in the past uh, and carbons because they're so abundant and they come from so many different sources they can be made into different forms and there's incredible advancements like mm -hmm. what you're mentioning uh, out there that companies are working on there's kind of three main classifications and there's definitely more than that, but I'm going to focus on the three main ones uh, around carbons. And you have things like a charcoal that is a fuel source that you can burn in your barbecues or to heat homes. Uh, you have activated carbons, which are used for filtration mediums. Like you'll have it in a Brita filter, for example, to filter your water. And then there's another product um, called biochar and carbon black and biochar are similar in how they're created, but different based on what the feedstock is or what you put into the process. Oh. Uh, and they've been long kind of advertised as a catch-all product. Like you can brush your teeth with it to whiten your teeth. You can sprinkle it on your garden to help grow plants. You can filter water and things like that with it. Uh, but they're all a product of a pyrolysis process. So you can take any organic or inorganic input run it through a process called pyrolysis. And what is, is basically, yeah, tell me what pyrolysis yeah, it's, is. It's basically the burning of what you're feeding okay. into this furnace with the, uh, it lacks the presence of oxygen. So whatever you put in rather than being a big flame, it just shrinks into a carbon shell mm -hmm. and it physically captures the gases that were in that material that would naturally decay into the environment as CO2. It physically captures them into a shell that is stable for thousands of years. So that's, permanent sequestration of carbon, which is what we want to achieve, taking it from the air and putting it into the dirt for thousands of years. Okay. Let so, me talk about a few things based on that. So number sure. one, what I'm hearing you say is that different feedstocks, whatever it is you're putting through the pyrolysis process will have different properties at the end, just because of the starting point and the uh, chemical composition of the, of the original feedstock being different. Is that, is that why different such feedstocks, different? how those feedstocks are prepared how they're pyrolyzed and then how they're post treated will create very different outcomes for, for product, hmm. for a carbon-based product. 
Okay. So how many different materials did you try through this pyrolysis <laughs> process before you found the perfect ones? Well over 1500 organic materials. And out of all those trials, two prove themselves to be good starting points for our product. Okay. And that was a very but hold on before you tell before we okay. spill the beans on what those two are, tell us what was wrong with the 1498 others. What 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 made them inappropriate feedstocks? Well, you look at physical structure. So what will this carbon shell look like once it comes out of the pyrolysis system and what can it physically support? So this is the size of the porosity and the diversity of that size. So as a great example, if all the pores were the same size in that carbon and they could only hold microscopic things, not water molecules or not air, that wouldn't create a good environment for growing plants, for example. So the physical uh, makeup of that particular pore structure of that plant and then the chemistry what is in that plant for chemistry and when we process it what is left at the end of the process talk to me a little more about that because i think it's again because i'm not a green thumb i know ph is really important whether soils are acid or, or alkaline is that's that i gather is one of the big issues of what you're what it is that you're looking for can you can you tell us what the sweet spot is and and then we'll get into the the two products that you found that make the that make the, so, the grade pH and other chemistry that becomes toxic to plants at some level of concentration are the things that we're focused on. So mm -hmm. our end product that we sell to a client, we would say that this is an empty container. It doesn't have a pH. It doesn't have other chemistry in there. It is just ready to absorb and accept whatever you put into that carbon shell. Mm -hmm. So for a grower, the nutrients and fertilizers or the microbes that you add, it will absorb those products and hang on to them to feed them back to the plant. So we're actually going for a very inert shell for growers that has nothing in it, which offers them consistency in a product. Batch to batch, our material is a, an identical clone of itself. And it doesn't have anything in the shell, unlike peat moss, for example, that may have good and bad things like pesticides or pests, for example. Okay. And what is the ideal pH that you're looking for? Because that was one of the things that when we were talking about other potentials, you said that some of them were, were pretty high, like a pH of 11 uh, was one of the examples you gave. What, what is, what, what's wrong with having a chemistry of 11 or higher when you're trying to plant? Plants like a very specific pH and different plants like a slightly different pH. So if you fall outside of the range that's ideal for that plant, the plant is actually unable to absorb certain nutrients from the medium. So that's why pH is so important. And pH is a little bit uh, misrepresented or maybe misunderstood is a better way to say it. It's actually in our product, not the pH level that's important. We send our material out with a five and a half to a six and a half pH. It's the buffering capacity of the material, which means the material's ability to maintain a certain level of pH. So in our case, we don't have any buffer. We send our material out with a five and a half to six pH, but it really becomes whatever the grower decides that they would like it to become. So if they feed their plants a nutrient solution that's a optimized for their plant, five and a half pH, that's what the material ends up becoming for the, oh. for the plant. Okay, so now let's spill the beans. So of 1500 that you tested, you found two that were appropriate. Tell us, tell, can you tell us or is it a state? Is it a, a yeah, I can tell you parts of it. So okay, we have two different feedstocks that we could have used. One is oak, and it comes from oak forests, which grow extremely slow. And no matter how you look at that, can you make it an environmental story? Uh, the other feedstock is a very specific type of bamboo. And for those of you that don't know, bamboos are actually a type of grass. They grow extremely fast, up to 12 inches per day. Like you can watch these plants grow. Um, but there's many, many species of them. There's thousands of different types of bamboo in the world. And they all have slightly different chemical and physical makeups. So we have found a couple of types of bamboo that work specifically for our process. Okay. I, I mentioned this, that you'd have to clarify on this one, because when we were having a worldwide shortage of bamboo to feed the pandas at the Calgary Zoo, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, maybe Pure Life could have helped. Is, is it the same kind of, of bamboo that the pandas eat? Well, I'm sure pandas could eat the type of bamboo that we farm, but the areas that we're farming our bamboo from don't have pandas. And we also sustainably manage our forestry. So that means we're not going in and clear cutting a forest, which strips the entire environment for, for all the local 
uh, animals that live in that in that forestry we actually are required to harvest our bamboo at a very specific age so it has the right physical and chemical structure at a certain point in its growth uh, time and that means that we go in and we selectively harvest the poles out of the bamboo forestry so we're taking less than five percent of the organics from that forestry and it's kind of like cleaning up the forest in your you know in your backyard we're taking out the rubbish and the things that would eventually fall over die decay release their gases back to the environment and then cause a potential for fires or things like that so it's about sustainable forestry management and there's actually carbon tax credits available for uh, forestry that is is managed in the way that we manage it for our feedstock supply. All right, we'll talk about that in a minute. One of the other things that you mentioned is that it's not like you're crowding out higher value crops on this land either. Can you can you sort of explain how you identified the the land for your farms? Yeah, so one of the things when you look at a environmentally and socially responsible company, if we had the perfect feedstock for our material, but it was required to grow on the best farmland in the world, that really wouldn't be a great sustainable feedstock to be able to use. So if you look at bamboo specifically, it grows almost everywhere. And we're talking about land that is not suitable for other types of uses. Some countries actually plant bamboo to stabilize landslides in certain areas for land that's prone to that. So we can grow it in areas where other things aren't meant to grow or aren't useful to grow. So it's sustainable from, from that perspective. To, to, this will come, become relevant in my some of my next questions, but but tell give me an idea of what kind of environment you need to grow bamboo. I, t I tend to think of it as being more of a, a tropical type of of plant that it you is. need so to be able to grow year round. Bamboos will actually grow almost anywhere in the world. You can even plant them in Canada. Just they they may or may not survive the winter, and they definitely won't grow that well uh, from a speed perspective. Um, so there's ideal places to grow. We we grow a lot of bamboo in various parts of Asia, mm -hmm. and we are currently working on a reserve down in Mexico. We could also grow our feedstocks, for example, in the southwest United States. So we look at different areas, and some of the key areas that we're focused, the Philippines, Mexico, and India, they already have very large forests that have the bamboo in it that we're after. And they're looking for companies like us that will go in and sustainably manage mm -hmm. those forests not go in and clear cut them and build new high rise buildings in their place. So you've got, I'm just trying to piece together all the elements of your environmental story. So one of them is that you're the land that you're using and the way that you're harvesting. Another one is the displacement of all of the, the peat because the other materials you're talking about when they break down, that's when the carbon gets released back into the environment. So I, we haven't fully talked that through when you talk about, you being able to capture this carbon and store it that is shelf stable for thousands of years that seems that seems almost remarkable so, so tell us how you know that well if you look at some of the other products that you mentioned out there they're they're single use products so mm -hmm. peat moss cocoa and stone wool growers use them once and then they throw them away uh, and they end up in in landfills or they end up going through different types of uh, recycling environments yeah in some very rare cases, growers will reuse mediums uh, once or twice, but when they do that, they're actually sacrificing quality of their, of their production. So production rates typically go down. Because our material, like I said earlier on, it's very hard and it's very stable. It lasts for thousands of years. We haven't been able to find an end of life to it. Hmm. So this means when we ship it to a grower and they use it in their facility, if they're allowed due to regulatory requirements, they can reuse our product forever. Mm -hmm. And all they have to do is top off when they grow in it. So functionally, if you think about what that does for the environment, those 60 million cubic meters of product that are moving around the world each, each year for, for indoor agriculture, when you grow in a material like ours, you're reducing that transportation in the first year because our product is actually more efficient. You use less of it than you would something like peat moss, for example. You're shipping less on the first shipment but on the second and third use, you're preventing the mining, transportation, and disposal of all of these products, which has a significant carbon impact uh, on the environment. And I think, Danielle, you know, you mentioned it about skeptics and things like that in your, in your opening statement. Um, I'm from the oil and gas industry, and I love the environment, and I love the people, and I love health. 
But at the end of the day, we're not alarmists. We're not running around saying that we have to solve all these environmental problems or else. But the way we look at it is we can do better. I think every human can look at the practices that we have going on in the world and say, we need to do better than what we're doing today. And that's what our products are really about. And every stage of our business really tries to encapsulate and is driven based off of that. So if you think about how you kind of walk through the different stages of our business, on the upstream side of our company, which is raw material production and sustainable forestry management, there's carbon tax potential uh, or credit potential from sustainably managing forest. And you get that based off of what was that land used for in the past and how are you managing it going forward? And is that better for the environment or worse for the environment than what and it let was me, conventionally let me, used And let me for? get you to unbundle that a bit because I think that that's what we've seen in Canada when we have managed forests that are net sinks. It's for the reason that you're talking about. If you're taking out all the dead wood uh, that would right. otherwise collapse and decay and then it's releasing carbon or methane back into the exactly environment, right. you're able to stop that, right? And this, this is where a lot of the arguments come around forestry management. If you're allowing that plant to grow, which it sucks CO2 for the environment while well, it does that, but then you let it die and decay, those gases go right back to the environment. So there's not really a great gain. Like some of it gets captured into the soil, but very little. In our case, we have a plant that's growing 12 inches per day, pulling an incredible amount of CO2 out of the environment while it does that. But instead of letting it naturally decay and release all those gases back, we're harvesting that, we're running it through a pyrolysis process, and we're capturing, say, 70% or more of those gases that would have naturally decayed and went to the environment and putting it into a hard physical shell. That's why our process is carbon negative. A lot of people kind of think of it and they say, well, if you're burning that, aren't you letting it go back to the environment? Because that's kind of the conventional wisdom around how a fire works. But again, we're actually capturing the gases that come off of this process, recirculating them and putting them back into a physical carbon shell. Okay. We're, we'll talk about the third part of your business in just a minute, because you've dealt, you've dealt with the upstream and the, and the downstream and the processing that you do. But you've said a couple of things that I think we just need to, to talk a bit more about. One is that you use less of the product because that's, uh, and then that it can be reused. So let's deal with the first one relative to how much peat stone wool and coca coir you'd need. How much of your product would you need to be able to replace that? On a it depends plant? on the type of grower and what type of crop they currently have. We've seen as much as a 90% reduction in use of volume. Uh, and conventionally we see 25% or more. So if you're thinking about conventional tomato crops for commercial growers, for example, that would typically grow in three, maybe more liters per plant. We're growing in two liters or even less, sometimes in some cases, one liter. Okay. And then when you say that it can be reused and just needs to be topped up, I guess I kind of think of these types of growing medium as being consumptive, that the, the plants need to consume some of it in order to be able to grow. Um, so so tell, me, tell me why it is that's not the case. That, that's interesting because this is these are problems that most consumers don't even know exist with current mediums. It's not that you're consuming the medium, it's that they naturally break down and you mm -hmm. can't use them for a long term because they naturally decay, they're organics. In our product, the carbon shell is just a container. It cannot be consumed, the plant never feeds off of it. It's just a storage vessel huh. for water, air and nutrients. So you feed that plant through your feed schedule, watering it with light fertilizers and things like that. And that is the component that the plant is consuming. So when the plant is done growing, it's, it actually forms a really fine root ball and all of the little granules of our product get stuck together by the roots of the plant. But you pick that plant up, you give it a good hard shake and all the granules break free from the little root hairs and fall back into the pot you end up with a root ball and a plant that you throw away, which still has a little bit of our product in it. I mean, you can work really hard to get it all out, but commercial growers won't spend that kind of labor doing it. So five to 10% of our product needs to be topped off in those environments. They replant back into the same container that they were just growing in and they're done. They go huh. on to their next crop cycle. That's wild. Okay, so let's talk about uh, fertilizer use and chemical use. Um, do, do you use, need to use the same amount of fertilizer and the same amount of pesticide in your in using your product? Well, most people don't use pesticide in our product, and that's another area where we're really changing the game for growers. 
pests do not like our product. Carbon at a microscopic mm -hmm. level is like glass. So as they crawl through our material, they end up in a position where it's very harmful to their bodies. So it's a natural deterrent. Mm -hmm. And pests like fungus gnats and root aphids, for example, they're known crop killers. They kill a significant amount of food crops around the world every year. And it's kind of interesting because if you ask a grower, do these pests target plant roots or the growing medium that the plants are growing in? So the organics, the algae, all the type of stuff that grows in conventional mediums, the answer is, I don't know, it doesn't matter because pests are just a problem that we've had for thousands of years and they're not going anywhere. In our medium, the organics are stored inside of microscopic pores. Pests can't get to them. And if they do try to physically get to them, the material harms them and hurts their bodies. So they're actually unable to crawl through the material and feed on the roots of the plant. So you're significantly reducing the risk profile for these for, for this type of, of risk. So you might need less chemical inputs, at least on the pesticide side. What about fertilizers? So less, less chemical inputs. On the fertilizer side, it's the same or less in every case. Hmm. So if you think about conventional soils, like your garden at home, for example, you spray fertilizer on there and you water and some of it runs off and some of it evaporates and all these things happen that reduce the amount of fertilizer that's actually available to your plants. Our products, absorb and hang on to these materials that you feed them. So when you feed our product, a fertilizer, it absorbs all the fertilizer into the porosity and it really holds on to it. Mm -hmm. So we have some growers that have reduced their fertilizer usage by up to 50%. Most growers are reducing their, their fertilizer by roughly 10 to 20%. And this really comes down to what they end up feeling comfortable with because They've been doing things a certain way for literally hundreds of years. So it takes a little bit of time to move them into the right direction. Good. The most interesting thing about that, Danielle, is it doesn't just apply to fertilizers. It applies to water as well. You do not have as much water running off or evaporating from our growing medium. So this is a, another area that is pretty impactful mm -hmm. from an environmental perspective. No kidding. So um, g give me a, so I've taken the view that uh, and I think it, this comes from Preston Manning saying that there's a natural affinity between conservatives and conser and conservation. They have the same core word at the at the base of it is you shouldn't want to be wasteful. You should be wanting to try to conserve. You want to use less material, use less pesticide, use less water, use less fertilizer, use less land space. Like all of this makes a lot of sense from an environmental point of view. But the other side of it is, does it make sense from an economic point of view? So I can see a, a number of ways in which you would be saving money because you're using less growing medium, medium that you have to replace on a given year. And then also the points that you made about water and, and chemical additives. But um, give us a sense of um, dollar for dollar. If people were to switch over to your product with all of those savings, is it still going to be a premium? Is it still going to cost them more money or do they save money? If you take all the performance benefits off the table and just look at our product pound for pound with other products, we're the yeah. same price or cheaper. And that almost never happens with environmentally responsible products. There is an economic reason to switch to our product without any of the environmental benefits that come along with it. And then in, in addition to all of the other benefits of using less input costs, you'll save money there too. And labor, all those types of things. So one of the things I didn't talk about and can be a long conversation, so I'm going to try to summarize the best that I can. A root system in a plant grows very differently in our medium than it does in other types of mediums. So the root hairs start to grow and they get trapped inside of the same porosity that the water and nutrients and everything else is, is trapped in. When that happens, the root is forced to grow new hairs that grow into other pores and also become trapped. So you end up with this very fine, I call it angel hair-like root system that is extremely high performance. And this is why you can use less volume of our medium versus another type of medium, extremely high performance root, root systems. So from that perspective, you end up with much, much less material, which from an economics and environmental perspective has a very significant impact. I mean, you're, to, you're talking about 80% to 100% less ships transporting peat around the world, less transport trucks or rail cars pulling it around the world, those types of things. And when you reuse the product, 
you're 100% stopping the farming of peat moss, which is one of the largest carbon sinks in the on the planet. Uh, it's, it's estimated that peat moss is one of the best natural ways to extract carbon mm -hmm. from the air. It's, it's Mother Earth's main defense against carbon in the air. Not to mention the land damage that comes along with physically mining massive amounts of land to pull this stuff out of the earth. Oh, it's amazing. The environmental story, which I want to get to as well, because that gets to your third type of business. But you did mention you'd also save labor. Why do you save labor with, with your approach? Uh, we save labor because there's a lot of labor in handling higher amounts or higher volumes of material. So you mm -hmm. think about like storage space, you think about uh, the handling of disposal and all those types of things. But also one of the neat things about our product is most growers don't transplant in it. So transplanting is kind of one of those activities that we understand plants go through different phases of growth and they require bigger volumes of substrate to grow in. In our product, you can start a seed in a 1.5 liter container of our product and you can grow it all the way through to a completed six foot tall tomato plant that has been commercially producing. Huh. You never have to move it. You never have to transplant. So there's significant labor reduction on that end. It's remarkable. Okay, uh, let's let's talk about the third part of your of your business as well, which is doing the very hard work of tracking and reporting the the carbon footprint. Because this is um, this is one of the areas I'm greatly frustrated with because it seems like our industries are doing amazing jobs in addressing this issue of reducing carbon, but we don't get credit for it. It's like I'm not I'm not sure where the barrier is because it seems to me that it should be very easy for us to start monetizing these streams. I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I, I have mentioned it before that when I was on radio and Justin Trudeau was talking about the, um, the way in which he was buying carbon credits, it came from a landfill that was capturing methane and flaring it. And that created enough of a reduction in emissions that it generated a credit that could be monetized. And from what you're telling me, all of the ways in which you're genuinely reducing and capturing CO2, genuinely reducing methane, reducing transportation uh, fuel, it seems to me like there should be a way to do a baseline test, capture the amount of savings, and then be able to turn that into an additional revenue stream. So t tell us a little bit about that process. It's complicated. Yeah. So we I actually we stood up we stood up a division in our company called ICO. It stands for Environmental Impact and Carbon Offset. And this is a division that kind of shadow functions inside of our upstream and downstream business. And it basically tracks everything that we're doing in a very, very transparent way. Because there's a lot of what they're calling kind of greenwashing or clean washing out there. It's where they take something that's not that great for the environment and try to make it sound like it's really great for the environment. Uh, and then they end up basically creating a bunch of confusion and questions, like what you're starting to ask about some of the, some of the projects that are being done out there. I don't want to get too critical on a specific type of project because I think the whole world needs to work together to just be better from a clean or a green perspective. So if they are moving at something in the right direction, I think we should be supportive of that and not try to beat them up too much on the technicalities. But there really is a lot of companies out there that are spending hundreds of millions of dollars advertising how amazing that they are and becoming market leaders in their segment around what they do, but they're not actually doing anything. They haven't mm -hmm. put any money into projects or equipment or, or technology. They're just talking like they do. And we, we run into this issue all the time, but I'm going to digress on that because I can get off on a, on a major tangent there. I'll get back to ICO and the carbon, the carbon tax credit side of the business. For us, what's important is whatever we're doing, we're being ultimately transparent about. Mm -hmm. We want people to criticize, we want input into our business around how we can do better. So ICO was designed to be able to track, leverage third party advisors, and then optimize what we're doing. So we break every part of the business down. For example, sustainable forestry management that we talked about earlier. What is the land we're managing it? How are we truly managing it? How are we treating the farmers that manage that land? How are we paying them? How are we doing all of these things and pull that together for a true story that's validated by a third party around what we're doing there? Now there's something called carbon pathways. And if you haven't heard about that, that's what you need to be able to fit into in order to be able to create a 
monetizable carbon tax credit at the end of the day. Before we before we get there, let let me just uh, talk to you about a couple of things. Um, you mentioned these third party assessors or advisors or validators. Wh- who are they? Are they are they Canadian companies? Are they international companies? Where would somebody who wants to go through the process you're doing of finding a pathway? How do you even get in touch with one of them? There's lots of companies out there that you can deal with. We're dealing with a business called Veresco that's headquartered right in Alberta. Uh, absolutely a leading organization as far as mentorship around what creation of true carbon credits should look like. Okay, I'm going to get the number from you because I think I should follow up and do a, a separate um, a separate podcast with them. So that's number one. Number two, the carbon pathways. This is the thing I've been sort of scratching my head over. I don't know who has the authority to create those pathways. It seems like it can be created through government legislation. And I've seen some legislation from South Africa where they identify a fairly small number, but at least it's clearly defined of what the pathways are. In uh, Canada, because we've got a split between the authority over environment between federal and provincial, are the pathways determined by the federal government? Are they determined by the provincial government? Do you have different ones when you go from province to province? Can Can you just shed some light on that? I can shed a little bit of light on that. And then I would defer you to a conversation with Karen over at Vresco because she is much more experienced on this than I am. And to be honest, I'm just learning. And so is most of the world. This is a new segment. So if you look around the world, different jurisdictions are doing things much differently. You have private markets for carbon credits and you have public or government based markets. And just depending on what your technology is and how it functions, you can fit into different areas of that market. So I'll focus specifically on uh, provincial and federal markets, because that's what we're working on mostly with Foresco. And that's really, there's these defined pathways that you can try to fit your business into. So for example, there's a pathway that already exists for sustainable forestry management. So we can spend a year of time and maybe close to a million dollars worth of capital and fit our business into that already existing pathway. Then we can look at other things that we're doing, like the reduction of transport of peat moss globally. So if there's 60 million cubic meters of peat moss moving around the world and only six of our product, that's a significant environmental savings. Or if you have products that are uh, single use versus our product, which is reusable for decades, that is a very good thing for the environment. But those pathways have not been created. So we actually need to invest through companies like Foresco, for example, in creating those new pathways, which take many years to accomplish, Mm -hmm. millions of dollars in capital. And when you launch that new pathway, the entire world gets access to it, not just your company, even though you're the one that paid for it. So, (laughs) but, but again, usually being first to market, I guess you get the benefit. Yes. Yeah. So most companies that create a pathway dominate that pathway. So would yours then have, uh, would you have two aspects? Would Because you talked about the upstream and downstream, or would you have an integrated approach? Um, well, we have upstream and downstream, and ICO works with both. So they would be taking all the credits that come from one and all the credits that come from another, putting them together, and then taking those to the market in a holistic way. So it's one of the ways that companies like ours look at potential revenue sources for our company. Not only do we have revenue generation from products that we're selling to our consumers, but we have revenue potential from the generation of carbon credits that some other businesses that are bigger polluters that cannot clean up or green up their their process they'll choose to partner with business with businesses like us because they want the long-term potential of our carbon carbon offsets i think that's really important if you don't mind if i dig into this just for a minute i get asked by a lot of environmental types like why would you want to partner with an oil and gas company around the environment and carbon tax credit creation because there's kind of that stigma out there like these companies are bad and these companies are good The reality is, is that those types of businesses aren't going anywhere. Even if we try to move away from fossil fuels over time, they're still going to be with us for a long period of time. And they're important to our economy and the way things function. So it's good to have a business like us headquartered in Alberta that can partner with Alberta based energy companies to help them green up or clean up their operations, not physically by changing things that they're doing on the ground, but allowing them to support businesses like us that are creating a negative carbon product, which offsets some of the carbon costs that they have. Well, it seems to me this 
conversation about environmental, social, and governance aspects so that you can have a profile that allows you to attract capital is becoming more and more important. And so um, I think in the past, we've seen a lot of energy companies invest in wind or solar in order to be able to make that case. But what I'm hearing now is that there's other ways that that uh, energy companies can invest in other types of product lines and other businesses and then be able to improve their ESG score, which then improves their ability to, to attract capital. Is that how this is supposed to work? Yeah, there are phenomenal companies in Alberta, not just ourselves, that have incredible technologies that are changing the game on a global basis for the for the environment while producing materials that are highly valuable to the consumer base. That's fantastic. Okay, now we get to getting to the issue of regulatory compliance. This is the thing that drives me a bit bananas is that everyone is talking about the urgency to address this problem. There's companies out there like yours who are urgently trying to do it. And then the regulatory process takes years before you get validation. I mean, what is the the holdup? Maybe I don't want to get you in trouble with any of the regulators, <laughs> yeah. uh, but maybe you can give some advice about what you're seeing as, as some policy improvements at the federal or provincial level to make it easier. Because it, it seems to me these, these pathways should be easier and faster to, val to validate because then that creates a revenue stream for other companies, which in, in would incent them to get into the market faster, which would then accelerate some of the kind of investments we're talking about. Um, and, that, and that's why I'm sort of perplexed about why it's so difficult to go through the process. Well, there's kind of three areas that I'd like to talk about here, and I'll break each one of them down. But these are significant challenges for companies like ours to be able to build our infrastructure and launch our business from a certain demographic or a certain province like Alberta. So the first one that I'll pick on a little bit, and I want to be careful because like you said, this can be a dangerous conversation. So I'm trying to be as respectful as I can, but fitting into existing framework. So when you have a new technology company that has created something completely different, I mean, the, the product doesn't fit into any conventional regulatory requirement standard that exists you run down this path where the regulatory bodies aren't really sure what to do with you. Hmm. And we had this happen to us the first year that we launched our business, we were required to have a certain certification. And we looked at you either fit into what exists or you invest heavily in updating those regulatory requirements to fit the new type of product that you're hmm. bringing to the market. Well, startups, especially technology ones that have spent all of their capital on research and development and actually manufacturing so they can get into a, a place of revenue, you find yourself running up against a serious conundrum. Uh, if you can't fit into what exists, you have to create something new, which takes time and money. If you do fit into something that exists or they, they push you into that box, which is what happened with us, you're not a perfect fit and it typically delays and drags out the process a little bit. So the dilemma becomes, do you invest significant time and money into fitting into this regulatory environment? Or do you invest that money into the advancement of your company in other ways that you need to advance to get revenue generation so you can apply for grants and all the other types of supports that are out there? This, this was a big problem for us. We went a year and a half without getting the approvals that we needed to sell mm -hmm. our product. And I was literally told we should sell our technology to a bigger company that has more money that can weather the storm. Um, and I was just in shock when I, when I heard that, but uh, we weathered the storm. We went almost a year and a half without sales before we got what we needed to be able to start commercially testing the product. So that's, that's kind of a, a framework challenge. It's like, you don't have the money to invest the time or the capital into fitting into the framework, but you don't have a choice. You either do it or you don't have a business. That's and really frustrating. We hear that we hear that so much that the permitting process is what really is the delay. It's wonderful that Alberta has an 8% corporate tax rate, but if it takes you 10 years before you're large enough and big enough and profitable right. enough to pay the 8%, you, uh, you've you got a 10 year existential problem of trying to make sure that you, you survive right. that long. So that's a so good you, point. You jumped right into my next point, like yeah. around, around tax breaks or grants and how they work in our experience so far through all the different entities they're looking at proven businesses with proven track mm -hmm. records and proven revenue streams well those types of businesses if i'm a multi-billion dollar company that has new technology and i'm looking for governmental support i care about tax rates more than anything else more than small grants 
companies that are startups that don't have revenue, tax breaks are important to the future operation of our company, the long-term success of it, but they don't do anything for you when you're not generating any taxes that you have to pay in the first place because you're not yeah. profitable. You're spending more than you're, than you're making. So grants become the lifeblood of companies that are in that new tech space and starting to launch something that they're going to compete with large global businesses on a global level. Well, we've had recent discussions where it's like, well, we only invest in companies that have three years of, you know, profitable uh, financial statements. Uh, and we've invested a few million dollars in this company or that company that moved their corporate office to Alberta for the tax breaks. Well, they came there because of the tax break and that $3 million you give them, they didn't even see on the balance sheet because it was small for them. $3 million funds my company for two years and gives me, gives me all kinds of technological advancements that that I wouldn't have without that type of support. Do you, I think before it, we leave this, like what would be an environment to be able to support pre-revenue companies? Because this is the, it's a really hard thing to, yeah. to wrap your head around, really. I mean, when you think about your scalability, once you get established and you're starting to build out your market, it's, it's immense because you've got the whole yes. peat moss market that you want to be able to, to, uh, to, to displace. But what, what is it you're supposed to do in that pre-revenue period? I, sh I should mention one proposal I've heard. I don't, I don't know that this is the best idea, but Quebec does it, that they, in particular for agriculture products, they've got a refundable tax credit on investment in R&D. So if you're investing in the technology yes. side of the business for agriculture and you live in one of the big cities, you can get a 20% refundable tax credit on that. If you are in the circle just outside of one of the major cities, it's 30%. And if you're uh, rural, as they define it, it's a 40% refundable tax credit. And so that's the only other kind of model that's been presented to me that I'm aware of. Is there is there any other uh, approach that you would take or what do you think of that one? It's really interesting that you bring that up because in the beginning of our company, the very first capital stack that we were putting together would actually utilize that type of environment. So British Columbia does the same thing and it's highly effective out there. Alberta did it for a certain period of time uh, and we were building a capital stack around that. We had incredible interest in investors, like a few million dollars lined up where they would be able to get a certain percentage of their original investment back. So they look at that like it's de-risking of their, of their original investment. Uh, the government had canceled that program at the time, so we were unable to follow through with it. Uh, I think it was heavily driven by a lot of the changes going on around COVID, so I'm not trying to be too critical of it. But I can tell you from personal experience, an incredible amount of interest was generated in our company because of the potential of getting uh, that tax rebate on their investment. So I'm personally a big advocate of that type of program for sure. Well, and I think we already do it for the film industry. I mean, there's a refundable tax credit, I believe, that they give on the labor cost that they pay. So there's a framework that we use for one particular industry. I just wanted to get your sense on that. And I'll, I'll yep. investigate it a little bit more. So you had three points that you were going to raise. Uh, we talked about the area of challenge being that there really isn't a fast track process to approve new products so you can actually get to market faster and sell. The second one is that the tax breaks are are really um, at the back end once you're already profitable, as opposed to, to creating a support system when you're pre-revenue. What's the third problem that you have? The third one is just like typical process and the barriers that you have to go through from a, a people perspective as you move new technologies through the government. So I'll give you a, a great example of this. And all of this, I think, is good. Like the government relies heavily on experts to advise them on new companies that are looking for assistance or partnerships with them. Uh, in our case, the government leans heavily on scientists as their experts. While scientists want proof that something works, they want to understand it completely, uh, which for a private company like us trying to protect our IP and not wanting to put out exactly how our treatment processes work, that can become a little bit of a problem. And if these particular people don't understand, or even in some cases believe in your product, they will not be supportive of what you have. And it's interesting because scientists typically take known things and make them better. They create new things by accident, and then they spend decades trying to convince their peers that what they did by accident is scientifically proven and supported by white paper. This is an issue that we've run up against. We've had situations where certain entities were not 
just not supportive of what we had. They did not believe that things could work the way that we said they could work. So in one case, we were basically told that you cannot use a 100% growing medium that's carbon-based to grow plants. That's impossible. Mm. Fortunately, the person that said that ended up in a commercial greenhouse that uses our product <laughs> and got to see it going head to head with other commercially available and high performing products. And we were significantly outperforming them. And that was an incredible win for us because I got a call that day from that group and they've been one of our strongest advocates ever since. But it took that moment of validation that we could not prove until they got into the environment where they seen it with their own eyes and just could not say it didn't work. What if we didn't have that going? What if we weren't able to get our product into that environment for them to witness it? We may have lost our company before it even started. So I'm being a little bit hard on process. And the reality is, is that governments and these institutes, they can't just support everybody and throw money out there to everybody. There has to be some form of a method of validating these technologies and bringing it you know, through to, to the different government programs. And I think that they can do that when they start looking at where is this company at in their cycle? Have they created technology? Have they had maybe educational institutes validate their technology? Like we had, for example, Innotech validate that it it works to grow a, a variety of crops. Lethbridge College has worked for it for a long amount of time. And then on the flip side of that, what is the market uptake potential? Not what is it today? No, we do not have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of sales today, but we have a company that can move into that type of environment very quickly. And to support that, we have some of the leading global agriculture companies that are the biggest three in the world distributing products that we would compete with that in some cases have invested in us. In other cases have been doing research projects with us for years around our product and they want to take our product to the market. What more do you need for validation? than that, that you have a product that works and is tested, but yet we're still bumping up against scientists in the government that say, nah, you haven't proven it. There's not a white paper that proves that claim. You know, I actually had one gentleman say to me, I made a claim around reduction of shipping is good for the environment. And it's like, well, can you prove that on a white paper? Like, do I have to? That seems pretty common sense to me, you know? So, you know, you've given me a, a really different take on those who say, well, we have to follow the science. We have to follow the science. What that actually is doing is putting in, in barriers and delays in some cases, particularly in the case of entrepreneurs. Cases, I yeah. bet there's I bet there's a ton of people who are confronting the same problem that you are as of trying to get validation for projects, uh, uh, be, especially because there's a consumer safety point of view. There's um, you want a consumer protection point of view so that you're not selling something that doesn't work. But you're right. There, there has to be a, a better way of doing it. I wonder if you've maybe chanced upon the solution there is that you uh, do a pilot project and then one of the regulators gets embedded for a year to watch it actually work so that they can validate with their own eyes that it actually works, like participate in the experiment themselves so that they're, they're not skeptical. I, want, I wonder if, if there's something to that, or do you have some other suggestion? You know, I'm not sure. And that's the tough part. Like it's easy to point fingers and say, there's all these problems that exist. It's not so easy to go out and fix them while mm -hmm. you're still protecting the government and the people that fund the government's interests. So, I don't know what the right answer is, Danielle, but I, I do know that uh, we need to have a look at some of these new tech companies. And again, not just companies that are optimizing something that already exists, but companies specifically that have created something that doesn't exist and is very different. And in that environment, we need some form of governmental system, probably with a balance of science and business and, and economics people that can look at these companies, talk to our partners, talk to the education institutes and actually put together a process of, we're gonna validate that this business has what it says that it has and that they can take it through to the market. The, the notion of trying to get to yes, as opposed to look for reasons to say no, that's a, oh a consistent issue that yes. we get. If you, if you start off saying, we wanna work with you and we'd like to get you to yes faster, let's figure out a pathway to do that. That would change the experience completely. 
Okay, let me sure. tell you what, you've got a few friends here. Uh, Ron is saying re reduce risk from pests, reduce need for fertilizer, reduce need for water, equals great value proposition for greenhouse hydroponic growers and environmental advocates. Uh, David says, our experience of using it has been a growing game changer. So you've got a, a, one of your customers who's listening in, he's been trying tomatoes, peppers, and he's gonna be trying others this year. Um, it says, uh, and Haiti says, I have yet to find a plant that will not grow in charged carbon from fruits, vegetables, cannabis, ornamentals, and cut flowers. They all love the product. So you, you've got some, some customers out there who are giving you some endorsements, feel pretty happy about, about what you've provided for them. Give us some sense of, of where your customer base is right now. What, tell us some of the things, I mean, we've already heard from a few, tell us some of the things that, that you've been able to, to do with this product. Who are the, your customers right now? Well, we're focusing mainly on indoor commercial uh, facilities. And the reason that we're doing that is we have limited product supply. Our Red Deer County facility, we've raised $14 million to complete the production of that plant. It's roughly 60% complete. Uh, we just got a partial occupancy uh, permit on the building. So we're now starting to produce some material in, in a reduced fashion out of that facility. And we choose to provide most of that product to the really big influencers in the market on a global level that can test, validate, and build what we call grower tools or standard operating procedures for specific plants being grown in a commercial environment in our product. So a lot of our product is going out to the, to the trial customers that are creating things that will help us launch and expand the company very quickly in the future. From there, we have a few select growers that have already gone through the trials with our product, and they're growing things like tomatoes, strawberries, cannabis. Um, we have some local Hutterite colonies that are doing all their plant starts this year in our product for their indoor commercial greenhouses. So it's starting to catch on across all different segments, which is the truly exciting thing about our product. Like it helps all types of growers so they can use it no matter what they're growing for a plant. Um, so that leads us into uh, an environment where we have a very large addressable market that we have to chase. We believe it's over a $26 billion market on a mm -hmm. global level. And we're just looking at each particular user and type of customer out there and saying, who do we need to partner with today that will influence uptake of our material in that area of the business in the future? So those are most of our clients. And then, of course, we have a lot of love for the little guy because we're the little guy. So at the end of the day, we pick some of these uh, one off producers in the US, in Canada, that we can see that they have a, a values alignment with our business. They care about people. They care about the planet. They're trying to do better. They're looking for advanced technologies. You know, they want to be able to, to outcompete their their other their other friends or other businesses that are that are out there operating and we go in and we support them on a kind of a one-off basis and we always start our relationships from the same perspective we put our money where our mouth is if you're a grower that wants to try our product we send you material to try we send you the support to be able to to learn and and optimize in our product and then you turn into one of our growers because you get to experience firsthand that it works and it works well in your environment. And we had a we had a CEO of a very large uh, ag, ag tech company that actually said, uh, and I'll quote what he said to me, we put your product up against the Formula One car of the industry with the biggest commercial uh, tomato strain on the planet. Not only did it perform just as well as this Formula One car product, but it provided other benefits that that product doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time we've ever grown in your product when we have three decades of learnings and advancements in this other product. Imagine where we will be three decades from now after learning in your material. Ooh, that's an endorsement. Okay, look, um, I have container boxes outside can you use your product outside or does it all have to be an indoor controlled environment? You can use it in any environment that you're growing in a container, indoors or outdoors. And we actually do have other products that are designed specifically for home garden uses. So you can blend it into your garden or you can blend it into the soil mixes that you're already using uh, to grow your plants in. Okay. So are small fries like me able to access that? Because we have a restaurant, <laughs> we have 
eight container boxes. So we grow our own herbs and our own tomatoes and our own flowers during the summer. And so I'm, I'm, I'd love to do a little test on sort of traditional planting in one of my, uh, one of my beds for, for tomatoes and, and then, and then try your product at another. Are you making that product available? So for uh, Alberta based growers, the enjoy center in Edmonton has it available on the retail shelves. Uh, we are working with distributors to bring it across Canada, and we're hoping to have it on commercial retail shelves uh, this summer. Oh, fantastic. And right now you can get it at, tell me again, Enjoy Center? Enjoy Center in okay. Edmonton. It's a it's a large greenhouse supply company. Uh, you can also reach out to us directly on our website uh, or on LinkedIn or any other social media platforms. We monitor them frequently and say, hey, where can I get some of this stuff? And we'll have our business development team reach out and, and get some off to you. All right. I love the sounds of that. Ryan, did we cover everything you wanted to cover? We covered a lot of ground, uh, but we did. I did know that there was a lot of ground to cover. Is Any other final words here? No, I just really appreciate getting the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, it's been a great platform and I think you're doing great things for the Alberta economy. Well, back at you. I think you're doing great things for the Alberta economy and I'm looking forward to seeing more. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you very much. All right, Rand, uh, Ryan Rand, he is the CEO and founder of Pure Life Carbon. And what a great story on so many fronts. This is the perfect window when you can find a product that makes sense from an economics point of view, makes sense from an environmental point of view, and also has uh, the kind of endorsements that he already has on the performance point of view. So um, anytime you come up with wonderful stories like that, let me know, because I think we're going to end up finding more and more of these problems, especially as we get into this world of innovation, that it could be that the regulators are standing in the way and putting up unreasonable barriers just because something's new. But entrepreneurship is all about something new, finding something that's game changing. So if you've got any other products that you want, you think that we should uh, take a look at and if there's any way we can add our weight with Alberta Enterprise Group to trying to clear away the cobwebs, we'd be happy to do that. I'm Danielle Smith, president of the Alberta Enterprise Group. We'll see you again next week.